morning, Coalition. It is great to see everybody this morning on this sunny, at least where I am, wonderful, cool morning. We've got uh, Bill Lamb, and uh, let me give it to uh, Allison so she can give us a quick update on what is going on. Hello, everyone. Good morning and happy Friday. Um, two things I have to share. One, just a reminder that our full coalition meeting is next Friday. Um, so look for an agenda coming out shortly. You should all have a calendar invite to that. So we look forward to seeing you again. And then the second update that I have is I did send out a member email yesterday that has a list of new resources and some events coming up. One event that I did want to point out is the Coalition on Aging's annual luncheon. There is a link to register in that meeting and Heather is also on if you have any questions for her there, but this will be the last Friday facts I can advertise for that. So please register for that. It should be a very great meeting. They are doing a hybrid event this year, so you can choose to attend in person or virtually. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat below. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. So, uh, and let me remind everybody, please to uh, sign in in the chat and give us your name and your organization. So, so we have Bill Lamb, who we have known for some time now. And uh, Bill is the president of the board of the organization called Friends of Residents of Long-Term Care. And uh, Bill, uh, it's great to have you with us. We're gonna start off with some other things though and then get into that role. So All right. tell, welcome and uh, tell us a little Thank bit you. about where you grew up and what you did when you were <laughs> younger and uh, give us a, a little bit of a, understanding of who Bill Lamb is, please. I see. Well, as, as I see some of the faces that are coming on, I've, I've got some people who actually may know some of, some of this history. Um, but anyway, um, see, so I was, I was originally, I was born in Iowa, uh, in a small town in Iowa, Lamar's, Iowa. If you've ever eaten Blue Bunny ice cream, if you look on the label, that, that ice cream came from my home, hometown. It, uh, Little, little small town in the northwest uh, corner of Iowa. Uh, my folks are both from Iowa. I have two brothers who we were all born there. Uh, the, the, to make a long story short, uh, my dad was one of those World War II vets that uh, you know went, went, to, went to Europe and all of that. And after you've seen Paris, you know, you can't keep that guy on the, on the farm. Um, and he, he basically uh, joined the American Red Cross after uh, the, uh, a stint in Iowa. Uh, and so, but he was working with the military. So I, I grew up like an army brat uh, in, in different places, uh, mostly in the Midwest, but we did have a tour in Japan uh, in 58. And I actually graduated from high school in Germany in uh in the 66 but it was a military dependent school system mm -hmm. um i had a high school history teacher that went, went to wake forest and i had a kind of a bond with him and uh i was looking for small liberal arts undergraduate oriented school and so that's what brought me to north carolina and i had never stepped foot in the state uh, i met my wife at wake forest and she is actually from winston-salem we got married and uh, the rest is, is history. We, uh, uh, I got a master's in social work at Chapel Hill, and I uh, got a master's in public administration from uh, NC State, and I've actually taken courses for credit at Duke. So I, you know, I get, give me money letters from all, all <laughs> four of them. <laughs> but do you have a team that you prefer? So I have, <laughs> very clear priorities. Your your loyalties always go with your undergraduate. So if Wake Forest is playing, I'm always there. And it goes Wake Forest, NC State, Carolina, and Duke in that order. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> oh, and my son went to Virginia Tech, so they that that, that comes up and, and they and they got all my money. So <laughs> Yeah. Now, so the question is, were you rooting for Virginia Tech or UNC when they were playing? The 
I, I was rooting for UNC. All right. There but, we yeah, go. It's like I said, they're in fifth place. So anyway. <laughs> so with all that education, what did you do, Bill? Well, I um, the when I got out of graduate school, I, I went to work for uh, the Division of Social Services. Mm -hmm. And I uh, and I worked for uh, a, a little over 30 years uh, for the state. And I split my career almost equally between our state division of social services and our division of aging. It's now the division of aging and adult services. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I, they were mostly administrative positions. Um, I got... Uh, the, I, I started off, I was a contracts administrator, but the, uh, uh, I, I got called into the director's office one morning and they said that they had this new program. It was just getting off the ground. The legislature was giving them a hard time about not doing it fast enough. Was I interested? And uh, I said, sure. And that was the community alternatives program. That was CAP DA. And at that point, we had three pilot counties. And, and so I got I was in, got into the ground floor of, of CAP. And that's what got me into aging and long-term care. Uh, hmm. The community alternatives program serves more than just elderly, but about 80%. I think that's still correct. About 80% of the, the clients in that program are, are older. And uh, so, you know, that kind of morphed into... Uh, a position in social services that was uh, uh, in the adult service program. And from there, I moved from the division of uh, social services to the division of aging in 88, I think. Uh, and I was the chief of planning there at the division. And uh, I stayed there. I re retired the first time in, uh, in 2000. Uh, that retirement lasted two days, Saturday and Sunday. And I went to work at the Institute on Aging over in Chapel Hill for another 13 years. And, and what got me caught up in long-term care was in the, in the mid nineties, uh, we used to call uh, assisted living domiciliary care. And there was a reform movement to kind of upgrade and review, revise the concept and all of that. And uh, I, I got captured with the policy area. Most of my focus had been on in-home, uh, but the, uh, you know, North Carolina has had a long historic commitment to supporting residential care in what we now call assisted living, more, more so than in other states. Uh, and that's, that's, that's good and bad. It has its own set of issues that goes along with that. And uh, that's where I met Marlene Chasson. That's where I got initially, Marlene was the executive director of Friends of Residence at that time. And uh, the, so that's, that's where I became familiar with the organization. And then when I, I retired uh, is when I got active as a volunteer with them. So, you, you mean when you retired for, for that time? Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, when I was working at the Institute on Aging, I, I was re retired. I was only working half time over there, although it was more like three quarter time. But anyway, yeah, that's yeah, my story. I, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got a lot of people that have a lot of sense of, of where you've been along the way, but uh, it's great to hear that story. So, when you said you were the director of planning in the right. division of aging, so what kind of things were you planning, and and sure. how did those things work out? So the, the at the point I came into that position, and I'm looking out now at some folks who've who've also <laughs> been either in that position or close to it, uh, and and who saw it. Um, there is a, a state plan requirement for Older Americans Act services. And so one of the responsibilities I had was to make sure that we were technically set up correctly and that we had done all that. And that's a lot of coordination with the area agencies on aging, but it's also related to, to building uh, 
the, the, the response to what the federal requirements are to administer that program. Um, what happened though, was our General Assembly passed a bill that required a, uh, the state to submit a state aging plan to the General Assembly. And the, it, in part, it was in response to all, all the line agencies who were coming over to the, to the legislature saying, we need more money because North Carolina's older adult population is growing faster and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, you know, the, it was more a message of, look, get your act together across all the agencies and bring it together and bring it to us in one package so <laughs> we can make some decisions about it. Uh, so that's what I did. So the, the, a lot of what I did was to relate to our other line agencies, social services, mental health, and Medicaid, and uh, the, the community college system, the prisons, uh, anybody that had any organization that had a stake in aging, and to try and get a sense of what were their initiatives going to be, and then what were the financial requirements that were associated with that. Uh, we also uh, were required to collect data, financial data and other kind of data uh, to present to the General Assembly to get a sense of, so what, what's the budget within in the state government the, that impacts older, older people? And that that's, sounds like a straightforward question, but it's not. So how do you parse the, the community college system as an example does not budget based on the age of the people who received their, their services, right. but to try and figure out ways to make estimates uh, across the different uh, organizations uh, uh, about what they do. And it, uh, so that's where it started. Uh, the event actually contained, that legacy continues there you go. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Our first state plan, you still have one, don't you? That's Heather Burkhardt. It was called Coming of Age. <laughs> North Carolina <laughs> comes of age, right? So, but that's what I did. And then I went to the work for the Institute on Aging and essentially from the, the Institute's mission uh, was to gerontologize the, the university system in North Carolina. And that was to promote aging related education, research and practice. Uh, I was the non-academic on that staff, but a lot of what I did was just an extension of what I had been doing at the Division of Aging, frankly, was to keep the Institute connected with the state interests, with AARP, with advocacy groups. Uh, I was, even though I had an office in Chapel Hill, I lived in Raleigh. Uh, you know, I didn't like going to Chapel Hill. They didn't like coming to Raleigh. It was a good fit. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. So, so Bill, what what are you most proud of in in this whole long career that you've had? What are the challenges that you and, and I know these are big questions, but what are the challenges that you have seen over time and, and currently see, and what recommendations would you have for us as an organization that's focused on serious illness in the state? Right. That's, a, that's a terrific question. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I have pride over several accomplishments. I, I, I do take some measure of pride in the in the community alternatives program mm -hmm. uh, when it it started it was just an idea it's institutional now it's a part of the landscape uh, it's uh, there are other things that have happened since uh, uh, since cap started uh, but a commitment to really providing uh, equitable alternatives regardless of the setting of care I think is a commitment that that germinated in that environment and continues uh, to this this day, although we still have an institutional bias. Um, mm -hmm. I, the tension that I've seen over my career 
uh, is is very present today. And so when we were arguing in the 90s in terms of the growth of the older adult population, we could show a growth in the budget. But if you put the two together, it's like, so the population curve is going up higher than the budget curve is going up. And you know, that's still present. The, as much as we feel like we're being successful, when you really look at, at are we in terms of just pure commitment in dollars and programs, keeping pace with the demand that is forced by our uh, growth in the older adult population, mm -hmm. the answer is no, we're not. Right. Uh, and, and that we're hiding from that question. It is almost like if we don't talk about it, it might go away. Uh, now we did hit, and this is the demographics of it, we did hit a, uh, we hit the depression era co cohort. Uh, recently in the recent history. So, you know, the demand curve is really driven by the people who are of advanced age, not not younger, older adults, but older, older adults. Yeah. Well, we're over that. So the, you know, we, we had a period 10 years ago where the demand kind of flattened a little bit because birth rates went down in the in the depression. Well, mm -hmm. the boomers so, you know, I was born in 48, I'm, I'm 73, it's about to go up again. I mean, the, with, with the boomers coming in, it's not just the, the general population of older adults, it's, it's us. And the, uh, with that, you get the morbidity and all the other issues that are gonna be driving the need for, need for care. And we're looking the other way. Yeah. We just, we're, we're not, it. So that, that, that to me is, is a concern. Uh, we do things and then pat ourselves on the back for doing them, but it's a Band-Aid and we need a tourniquet. Uh, the other thing is that we, we still have, we're taking the baggage of a, of a long-term care system that is kind of old and is not responsive to the kind of the new technologies or the new preferences and desires of older people. And it's like, we keep trying to hammer it into the same structure that we've been dealing with for years. You know, we still have the institutional bias in care. Uh, the, the, the care is not well rationed. Uh, it's kind of first come first serve. And once you get it, you know, the next person in line, if they, if there's not money available, doesn't get it. Uh, so we don't have ways of kind of targeting real well, you know, all of those kinds of problems just, you know, continue on. Uh, what, what's, there's what's, still lots of work to be done. What's, what's a way that we could um, flex and, and incorporate some of these new technologies. I, I know we've got telehealth and, and those kinds of initiatives, but um, g give us an, an idea of how we could be more responsive as we continue to hit this graying of, of the state, graying of America. Well, I, I do think telehealth is, is, is a part of that uh, paradigm. Uh, I think, so I, you know, we, we started off I, in terms of what I'm doing with friends of residents and long-term care as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there, there is a move within long-term care to move into smaller, more community-based dwellings that still have healthcare as a part of them, but to move away, away from a medical model of, uh, of care. So it, it looks less like a hospital. Uh, the, uh, and, and I think, you know, part of the response we've seen in the pandemic is that our institutional hospital type facilities with large populations, you know, it's great for achieving economies of scale, but it's not great for uh, creating both a home-like environment, but also infection control kinds of things and spread of disease. And, and when we hit a pandemic, I mean, it, the, 
th those people people were incredibly vulnerable, and yet we're going to keep building those kinds of buildings. It seems to me that we need to rethink what all that kind of stuff means. Problem with that: price of poker goes up, uh, and the the there's not a way to dance around that. Uh, so the and I'll the, I will say this among friends, and if you want to beat on me, that's fine. So I I made a living with cap by saying that community-based care is cheaper than institutional care. The secret is it's not. Mm -hmm. If you try and replicate the level of services that are provided in a nursing home for a very medically fragile person, you cannot do that 24 seven at a cost less than a larger facility. The economies of scale run against you. So when I argue for let's push into more home care, let's push into uh, smaller facilities, the only way the paradigm works in terms of home care being cheaper is if you don't push the services with them. You put more of the burden on family members for free care, or you don't give services at a level that you give in another place. And I think we have to come to serious terms with that in terms, is, is this what we really want to have for our, our, our uh, aging? And uh, you know, I, I think we can, we can do a better job with that, uh, but it's a reality. That, so I don't know, did that answer your question? I mean, it, it's food for thought. Well, it, it certainly does. Uh, it gives a, a lot of pause in terms of how we how we get there. Uh, well, all right, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you an example of this, and it's an issue that we're all dealing with right now, and that's the pay of the direct care workers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're we're arguing to try and bring folks up to a livable wage, and we're you know using fifteen dollars an hour. That is going to have a budget impact. Uh, in terms of who's going to pay for that. Either the public is going to pay for it with the way we set up our Medicaid reimbursement and all the rest of that, but private pay. The, most of, most of long-term care is out of pocket. So if we end up setting a labor market up where we should be paying these people more for the kind of care they're given, that means that even in the private pay system, the, the, the market, the labor market's going to go up if you want care. And the, the, it, the reality and, and the folks in our age, I mean, we've lived through it now with our parents and things like that. Uh, the long-term care is not cheap. And the, uh, it's going to have an impact on, on personal out-of-pocket expenses. And if people don't pay that, you're going to end up seeing it's going to poke out in other kinds of problem areas. Uh, the, we haven't even talked about adult protective services, but we've got lots of folks in the state who are being neglected, who are not being provided care because the families no longer have the capacity to, to pay for it or provide it. Or the lifestyles are such that, you know, there used to be, uh, I mean, it's like everybody has to work in order to meet their own needs. So the available caregiver, there used to be somebody in the family who would do it, it's no longer there. Yep, absolutely. And and as you know, we've we've got a working group. We've got four working groups, and w one of them is focused on caregiving and patient engagement. And right. right. Uh, Sue Collier was our initial, our our uh, inaugural, I should say, uh, uh, leader of that, uh, along with. Uh, uh, Laura Jane. Laura Jane. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I lost it for a second. Uh, and 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 Sue has a question. She says, "So how can we in, engage more?" And and she's asking, "How does the Friends of Residents engage with long-term care ombudsmen in the local volunteer, state, national uh, manner?" And and then Charlotte Sweeney asks the further question: "So how can we get to that?" kind of care that you're describing if 
if we have the healthcare system that we have today, and I, I know I'm asking a lot of questions there in the last five minutes of our discussion, but uh, try, right. to, try to answer those, Bill. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the stuff we continue to work, we, we continue. Well, all right, so the, the, the one frustrating thing that I hadn't had a chance to talk about is the kind of issues that we were dealing with as an organization, advocacy organization when we were founded in 1987 are the same ones we're dealing with today. I mean, it is, I, you can take that script and just roll it forward. Uh, so obviously these things are not that easy to, to try and, and solve. Uh, I think it is a, a function of recognizing the connections between, so to have quality in a long-term care system, you do have to have strong, a strong regulatory base that is enforced. So there, the, there's gotta be that kind of structure around it. You have to be able to, and willing to set your standards high. If you let the market try and clear it, I mean, this is a for-profit industry. The way you, you make money in this, in this system is to be able to provide the least amount of care by the cheapest people you can and put the rest of the money in your pocket. So we've gotta have systems that control that but we also have to have ways to support, financially support the provision of care. And that's a combination, I think, of public monies, uh, promotion of, of things like long-term care insurance. Uh, you know, we flirted with that and then got away from it. I think we, we do need to push self-insurance. Uh, you know, the, the insurance model basically is to get people to recognize it's gonna cost them, but you need to have them understand that when they're when they're earning at the point where they're at least risk for this and how to how to promote that kind of self self support kind of thing uh, and then to cover those who don't have the capacity because of their life experiences and work that's we've got to put all of those pieces together and if you don't it's going to fall off somewhere somehow absolutely so your good friend, John Tomo, wondered if you saw growth in the community care collaborative or village model as an alternative to uh, institutional care. John, my wife paid you for that, <laughs> that question. So we, uh, the, I live in Cameron Park in Raleigh, and the, we are actually in a village now. The, uh, and I think that that. I think John's got a good thing that in addition to money, the uh, promotion of a, uh, you know, it takes a village. So promotion of the notion of uh, a collective interest in aging, uh, mutual support, uh, things like taking advantage of opportunities that can present itself, but also the notion of uh, uh, being able to work collectively in, when, when you are potentially buying care, that the, you know, part of the health industry makes money because they sell to individuals on an individual basis. Well, when you've got naturally occurring retirement communities, you can have a collective get together and say, let's cut a deal. And that's, those systems will respond. But I think that's, that's the, some of the opportunities are there with uh, the villages and the and villages are going on now in North Carolina. You're seeing them more and more uh, come to the front. Unfortunately, it's like most of these ideas, most of the villages are coming out of wealthy neighborhoods. And that the, the issue that as a society we have to pay attention to is how do we make sure the opportunities are present to all people in our society. Absolutely. So I would get beat on. I need to do. I know we're coming closing in on the end. I get beat on if I didn't say this. Friends of Residents is having an annual gala event on October 22nd. There will be more information that will be coming out of that about that. It is a. Uh, it will be a virtual event. It is a lot of fun. We we give awards. We have entertainment. Uh, we recognize facilities, best practices. Uh, all of those kinds of things. So hopefully you all can get that information out to your, your network as well. And I thank you and your wife for being supporters of that in the past, as well as many of the people on this call. 
Absolutely. Well, th thank you very much, Bill. And Steve Hahn, who is, I know, on your board, has put the information in the chat. So, uh, and we'll, we'll promote that uh, further in the coalition uh, newsletter and, and so forth. So, um, Bill, it's great to have you with us. Uh, finally, it's taken us a while to get get you on, but uh, it's been great. And you are truly a, uh, an icon here in North Carolina. And we hope that you uh, continue to work in this area because uh, we- Oh, I benefits. will. Yeah, I will. Indeed. All right. Thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Bill. Great to have you. Y'all have a great week. All right. Bye-bye.